Ting A Ling and the five magicians Ting A Ling, for some weeks after the death of his young companion, Ling A Ting, seemed quite sad and dejected. He spent nearly all his time lying in a half-opened rose bud, and thinking of the dear little creature who was gone. But one morning, the bud having become a full-blown rose, its petals fell apart, and dropped little Ting A Ling out on the grass. The sudden fall did not hurt him, but it roused him to exertion, and he said, Oh ho! This will never do. I will go up to the palace, and see if there is anything going on. So off he went to the great palace, and sure enough something was going on. He had scarcely reached the courtyard, when the bells began to ring, the horns to blow, the drums to beat, and crowds of people to shout and run in every direction, and there was never such a noise and hubbub before. Ting A Ling slipped along close to the wall, so that he would not be stepped on by anybody, and having reached the palace, he climbed up a long trailing vine, into one of the lower windows. There he saw the vast audience chamber filled with people, shouting, and calling, and talking, all at once. The Grand Vizier was on the wide platform of the throne, making a speech, but the uproar was so great that not one word of it could Ting A Ling hear. The king himself was by his throne, putting on the bulky boots, which he only wore when he went to battle, and which made him look so terrible that a person could hardly see him without trembling. The last time that he had worn those boots, as Ting A Ling very well knew, he had made war on a neighboring country, and had defeated all the armies, killed all the people, torn down all the towns and cities, and every house and cottage, and plowed up the whole country, and sowed it with thistles, so that it could never be used as a country any more. So Ting A Ling thought that as the king was putting on his war boots, something very great was surely about to happen. Hearing a fizzing noise behind him, he turned around, and there was the prince in the courtyard, grinding his sword on a grindstone, which was turned by two slaves, who were working away so hard and fast that they were nearly ready to drop. Then he knew that wonderful things were surely coming to pass, for in ordinary times the prince never lifted his finger to do anything for himself. Just then, a little page, who had been sent for the king's spurs, and couldn't find them, and who was therefore afraid to go back, stopped to rest himself for a minute against the window where Ting A Ling was standing. As his head just reached a little above the window seat, Ting A Ling went close to his ear and shouted to him, to please tell him what was the matter. The page started at first, but, seeing it was only a little fairy, he told him that the princess was lost, and that the whole army was going out to find her. Before he could say anything more, the king was heard to roar for his spurs, and away ran the little page, whether to look again for the spurs, or to hide himself, is not known at the present day. Ting A Ling now became very much excited. The princess Alphalia, who had been married to the prince but a month ago, was very dear to him, and he felt that he must do something for her. But while he was thinking what this something might possibly be, he heard the clear and distinct sound of a tiny bell, which, however, no one but a fairy could possibly have heard above all that noise. He knew it was the bell of the fairy queen, summoning her subjects to her presence, and in a moment he slid down the vine, and scampered away to the gardens. There, although the sun was shining brightly, and the fairies seldom assembled but by night, there were great crowds of them, all listening to the queen, and keeping much better order than the people in the king's palace. The queen addressed them in soul-stirring strains, and urged everyone to do their best to find the missing princess. In the night she had been taken away, while the prince and everybody were asleep. And now, said the queen, untying her scarf, and holding it up, away with you, everyone. Search every house, garden, mountain, and plain, in the land, and the first one who comes to me with news of the princess Alphalia, shall wear my scarf. And, as this was a mark of high distinction, and conveyed privileges of which there is no time now to tell, the fairies gave a great cheer, which would have sounded to you, had you heard it, like a puff of wind through a thicket of reeds, and they all rushed away in every direction. Now, though the fairies of this tribe could go almost anywhere, through small cracks and keyholes, under doors, and into places where no one else could possibly penetrate, they did not fly, or float in the air, or anything of that sort. When they wished to travel fast or far, they would mount on butterflies and all sorts of insects, but they seldom needed such assistance, as they were not in the habit of going far from their homes in the palace gardens. 
Ting Ling ran, as fast as he could, to where a friend of his, whom we have mentioned before kept grasshoppers and butterflies to hire, but he found he was too late, every one of them was taken by the fairies who had got there before him. Never mind, said Ting a Ling to himself, I'll catch a wild one, and, borrowing a bridle, he went out into the meadows, to catch a grasshopper for himself. He soon perceived one, quietly feeding under a clover blossom. Ting a Ling slipped up softly behind him, but the grasshopper heard him, and rolled his big eyes backward, drawing in his hind legs in the way which all boys know so well. What's the good of his seeing all around him? thought Ting a Ling, but there is no doubt that the grasshopper thought there was a great deal of good in it, for, just as Ting a Ling made a rush at him, he let fly with one of his hind legs, and kicked our little friend so high into the air, that he thought he was never coming down again. He landed, however, harmlessly on the grass on the other side of a fence. Nothing discouraged, he jumped up, with his bridle still in his hand, and looked around for the grasshopper. There he was, with his eyes still rolled back, and his leg ready for another kick, should Ting a Ling approach him again. But the little fellow had had enough of those strong legs, and so he slipped along the fence, and, getting through it, stole around in front of the grasshopper, and, while he was still looking backward with all his eyes, Ting a Ling stepped quietly up before him, and slipped the bridle over his head. It was of no use for the grasshopper to struggle and pull back, for Ting a Ling was astraddle of him in a moment, kicking him with his heels, and shouting, Hi! Hi! Away sprang the grasshopper like a bird, and he sped on and on, faster than he had ever gone before in his life, and Ting a Ling waved his little sword over his head, and shouted, Hi! Hi, so on they went for a long time, and in the afternoon the grasshopper began to get very tired, and did not make anything like such long jumps as he had done at first. They were going down a grassy hill, and had just reached the bottom, when Ting a Ling heard someone calling him. Looking around him in astonishment, he saw that it was a little fairy of his acquaintance, younger than himself, named Parsley, who was sitting in the shade of a wide-spreading dandelion. Hello, Parsley, cried Ting a Ling, reining up. What are you doing there? Why you see, Ting a Ling, said the other, I came out to look for the princess. You, cried Ting a Ling, a little fellow like you. Yes, I, said Parsley, and Sourgrass and I rode the same butterfly, but by the time we had come this far, we got too heavy, and Sourgrass made me get off. And what are you going to do now, said Ting a Ling. Oh, I'm all right, replied Parsley. I shall have a butterfly of my own soon. How's that? asked Ting a Ling, quite curious to know. Come here, said Parsley, and so Ting a Ling got off his grasshopper, and led it up close to his friend. See what I've found, said Parsley, showing a cocoon that lay beside him. I'm going to wait till this butterfly's hatched, and I shall have him the minute he comes out. The idea of waiting for the butterfly to be hatched, seemed so funny to Ting a Ling, that he burst out laughing, and Parsley laughed too, and so did the grasshopper, for he took this opportunity to slip his head out of the bridle, and away he went. Ting a Ling turned and gazed in amazement at the grasshopper skipping up the hill, and Parsley, when he had done laughing, advised him to hunt around for another cocoon, and follow his example. Ting a Ling did not reply to this advice, but throwing his bridle to Parsley, said, there, you would better take that. You may want it when your butterfly's hatched. I shall push on. What? Walk? cried Parsley. Yes, walk, said Ting a Ling. Goodbye. So Ting a Ling traveled on by himself for the rest of the day, and it was nearly evening when he came to a wide brook with beautiful green banks, and overhanging trees. Here he sat down to rest himself, and while he was wondering if it would be a good thing for him to try to get across, he amused himself by watching the sports and antics of various insects and fishes that were enjoying themselves that fine summer evening. Plenty of butterflies and dragonflies were there, but Ting a Ling knew that he could never catch one of them, for they were nearly all the time over the surface of the water, and many a big fish was watching them from below, hoping that in their giddy flights, some of them would come near enough to be snapped down for supper. There were spiders, who shot over the surface of the brook as if they had been skating, and all sorts of beautiful bugs and flies were there, green, yellow, emerald, gold, and black. 
At a short distance, Ting A Ling saw a crowd of little minnows, who had caught a young tadpole, and, having tied a bluebell to his tail, were now chasing the affrighted creature about. But after a while the tadpole's mother came out, and then the minnows caught it. While watching all these lively creatures, Ting A Ling fell asleep, and when he awoke, it was dark night. He jumped up, and looked about him. The butterflies and dragonflies had all gone to bed, and now the great night bugs and buzzing beetles were out, the katydids were chirping in the trees, and the frogs were croaking among the long reeds. Not far off, on the same side of the brook, Ting A Ling saw the light of a fire, and so he walked over to see what it meant. On his way, he came across some wild honeysuckles, and, pulling one of the blossoms, he sucked out the sweet juice for his supper, as he walked along. When he reached the fire, he saw sitting around it five men, with turbans and great black beards. Ting A Ling instantly perceived that they were magicians, and, putting the honeysuckle to his lips, he blew a little tune upon it, which the magicians hearing, they said to one another, there is a fairy near us. Then Ting A Ling came into the midst of them, and, climbing up on a pile of cloaks and shawls, conversed with them, and he soon heard that they knew, by means of their magical arts, that the princess had been stolen the night before, by the slaves of a wicked dwarf, and that she was now locked up in his castle, which was on top of a high mountain, not far from where they then were. I shall go there right off, said Ting A Ling. And what will you do when you get there, said the youngest magician, whose name was Zamkar. This dwarf is a terrible little fellow, and the same one who twisted poor Nerolina's head, which circumstance of course you remember. He has numbers of fierce slaves, and a great castle. You are a good little fellow, but I don't think you could do much for the princess, if you did go to her. Ting A Ling reflected a moment, and then said that he would go to his friend, the giant Ter Eli Ra, but Zamkar told him that that tremendous individual had gone to the uttermost limits of China, to launch a ship. It was such a big one, and so heavy, that it had sunk down into the earth as tight as if it had grown there, and all the men and horses in the country could not move it. So there was nothing to do but to send for Ter Eel I Ra. When Ting A Ling heard this, he was disheartened, and hung his little head. The best thing to do, remarked Alcahazer, the oldest of the magicians, would be to inform the king and his army of the place where the princess is confined, and let them go and take her out. Oh no, cried Ting A Ling, who, if his body was no larger than a very small pea pod, had a soul as big as a watermelon. If the king knows it, up he will come with all his drums and horns, and the dwarf will hear him a mile off and either kill the princess, or hide her away. If we were all to go to the castle, I should think we could do something ourselves. This was the longest speech that Ting A Ling had ever made, and when he was through, the youngest magician said to the others that he thought it was growing cooler, and the others agreed that it was. After some conversation among themselves in an exceedingly foreign tongue, these kind magicians agreed to go up to the castle, and see what they could do. So Zamkar put Ting A Ling in the folds of his turban, and the whole party started off for the dwarf's castle. They looked like a company of traveling merchants, each one having a package on his back and a great staff in his hand. When they reached the outer gate of the castle, Alcahazer, the oldest, knocked at it with his stick, and it was opened at once by a shiny black slave, who, coming out, shut it behind him, and inquired what the travelers wanted. Is your master within? asked Alcahazer. I don't know, said the slave. Can't you find out? asked the magician. Well, good merchant, perhaps I might, but I don't particularly want to know, said the slave, as he leaned back against the gate, leisurely striking with his long sword at the night bugs and beetles that were buzzing about. My friend, said Alcahazer, don't you think that is rather a careless way of using a sword? You might cut somebody. That's true, said the slave. I didn't think of it before, but he kept on striking away, all the same. Then stop it, said Alcahazer, the oldest magician, striking the sword from his hand with one blow of his staff. Upon this, up stepped Ormondas, the next oldest, and whacked the slave over his head, and then Mahala, the next oldest, struck him over the shoulders, and Akbek, the next oldest, cracked him on the shins, and Zamkar, the youngest, punched him in the stomach, and the slave sat down, and begged the noble merchants to please stop. So they stopped, and he humbly informed them that his master was in. 
We would see him, said Alcahaza. But, sirs, said the slave, he is having a grand feast. Well, said the magician, we're invited. Oh noble merchants, cried the slave, why did you not tell me that before, and he opened wide the gate, and let them in. After they had passed the outer gate, which was of wood, they went through another of iron, and another of brass, and another of copper, and then walked through the courtyard, filled with armed slaves, and up the great castle steps, at the top of which stood the butler, dressed in gorgeous array. Whom have you here, base slave, cried the gorgeous butler. Five noble merchants, invited to my lord's feast, said the slave, bowing to the ground. But they cannot enter the banqueting hall in such garbs, said the butler. They cannot be noble merchants, if they come not nobly dressed to my lord's feast. Oh sir, said Alcahaza, may your delicate and far-reaching understanding be written in books, and taught to youth in foreign lands, and may your profound judgment ever overawe your country. But allow us now to tell you that we have gorgeous dresses in these our packs. Would we soil them with the dust of travel, ere we entered the halls of my lord the dwarf? The butler bowed low at this address, and caused the five magicians to be conducted to five magnificent chambers, where were slaves, and lights, and baths, and soap, and towels, and wash rags, and toothbrushes, and each magician took a gorgeous dress from his pack, and put it on, and then they were all conducted with Ting a Ling still in Zamkar's turban, to the grand hall, where the feast was being held. Here they found the dwarf and his guests, numbering a hundred, having a truly jolly time. The dwarf, who was dressed in white to make him look larger, was seated on a high red velvet cushion at the end of the hall, and the company sat cross-legged on rugs, in a great circle before him. He was drinking out of a huge bottle nearly as big as himself, and eating little birds, and judging by the bones that were left, he must have eaten nearly a whole flock of them. When he saw the five magicians entering, he stopped eating, and opened his eyes in amazement, and then shouted to his servants to tell him who these people were, who came without permission to his feast, but as no one knew, nobody answered. The guests, seeing the stately demeanor and magnificent dresses of the visitors, thought that they were at least five great monarchs. My lord the dwarf, said Alcahaza, advancing toward him, I am the king of a far country, and passing your castle, and hearing of your feast, I have made bold to come and offer you some of the sweet-tasting birds of my kingdom. So saying, he lifted up his richly embroidered cloak, and took from under it a great silver dish containing about two hundred dozen hot, smoking, delicately cooked, fat little birds. Under the dish were fastened lamps of perfumed oil, all lighted, and keeping the savory food nice and hot. Making a low bow, the magician placed the dish before the dwarf, who tasted one of the birds, and immediately clapped his hands with joy. Great king, he cried, welcome to my feast. Slaves, quick, make room for the great king. As there was no vacant place, the slaves took hold of one of the guests, and gave him what the boys would call a hist, right through the window, and Alcahaza took his place. Then stepped forward Ormondas, and said, My lord the dwarf, I am also the king of a far country, and I have made bold to offer you some of the wine of my kingdom. So saying, he lifted his gold-lined cloak, and took from beneath it a crystal decanter, covered with gold and ruby ornaments, with 101 beautifully carved silver goblets hanging from its neck, and which contained about 11 gallons of the most delicious wine. He placed it before the dwarf, who, having tasted the wine, gave a great cheer, and shouted to his slaves to make room for this mighty king. So the slaves took another guest by the neck and heels, and sent him, slam bang, through the window, and Ormondas took his place. Then stepped forward Mahala, and said, My lord the dwarf, I am also the king of a far country, and I bring you a sample of the venison of my kingdom. So saying, he raised his velvet cloak, trimmed with diamonds, and took from under it a whole deer, already cooked, and stuffed with oysters, anchovies, buttered toast, olives, tamarind seeds, sweet marjoram, sage, and many other herbs and spices, and all piping hot, and smelling deliciously. This he put down before the dwarf, who, when he had tasted it, waved his goblet over his head, and cried out to the slaves to make room for this mighty king. So the slave seized another guest, and out of the window, like a shot, he went, and Mahala took his place. 
Then Akbek stepped up, and said, My lord the dwarf, I am also the king of a far country, and I bring you some of the confections of my dominions. So saying, he took from under his cloak of gold cloth, a great basket of silver filagree work, in which were cream chocolates, and burnt almonds, and sponge cake, and ladies' fingers, and mixtures, and ginganuts, and whorehound candy, and gum drops, and fruit cake, and cream candy, and mint stick, and pound cake, and rock candy, and butter taffy, and many other confections, amounting in all to about 220 pounds. He placed the basket before the dwarf, who tasted some of these good things, and found them so delicious, that he lay on his back and kicked up his heels in delight, shouting to his slaves to make room for this great king. As the next guest was a big, fat man, too heavy to throw far, he was seized by four slaves, who walked him Spanish right out of the door, and Akbek took his place. Then Zamkar stepped forward and said, My lord the dwarf, I also am king of a far country, and I bring you some of the fruit of my dominions. And so saying, he took from beneath his gold and purple cloak, a great basket filled with currants as big as grapes, and grapes as big as plums, and plums as big as peaches, and peaches as big as cantaloupes, and cantaloupes as big as watermelons, and watermelons as big as barrels. There were about nineteen bushels of them all together, and he put them before the dwarf, who, having tasted some of them, clapped his hands, and shouted to his slaves to make room for this mighty king, but as the next guest had very sensibly got up and gone out, Zamkar took his seat without any delay. Then Ting a Ling, who was very much excited by all these wonderful performances, slipped down out of Zamkar's turban, and, running up towards the dwarf, cried out, My lord the dwarf, I am also the king of a far country, and I bring you, and he lifted up his little cloak, but as there was nothing there, he said no more, but clambered up into Zamkar's turban again. As nobody noticed or heard him, so great was the bustle and noise of the festivity, his speech made no difference one way or the other. After everybody had eaten and drunk until they could eat and drink no more, the dwarf jumped up and called to the chief butler, to know how many beds were prepared for the guests, to which the butler answered that there were thirty beds prepared. Then, said the dwarf, give these five noble kings each one of the best rooms, with a down bed, and a silken comfortable, and give the other beds to the twenty-five biggest guests. As to the rest, turn them out. So the dwarf went to bed, and each of the magicians had a splendid room, and twenty-five of the biggest guests had beds, and the rest were all turned out. As it was pouring down rain, and freezing, and cold, and wet, and slippery, for the weather was very unsettled on this mountain, and all these guests, who now found themselves outside of the castle gates, lived many miles away, and as none of them had any hats, or knew the way home, they were very miserable indeed. Alcahazer did not go to bed, but sat in his room and reflected. He saw that the dwarf had given this feast on account of his joy at having captured the princess, and thus caused grief to the king and prince, and all the people, but it was also evident that he was very sly, and had not mentioned the matter to any of the company. The other magicians did not go to bed either, but sat in their rooms, and thought the same thing, and Ting a Ling, in Zamkar's turban, was of exactly the same opinion. So, in about an hour, when all was still, the magicians got up, and went softly over the castle. One went down into the lower rooms, and there were all the slaves, fast asleep, and another into one wing of the castle, and there were half the guests, fast asleep, and another into the other wing, and there were the rest of the guests, fast asleep, and Alcahazer went into the dwarf's room, in the center of the castle, and there was he, fast asleep, with one of his fists shut tight. The magician touched his fist with his magic staff, and it immediately opened, and there was a key. So Alcahazer took the key, and shut up the dwarf's hand again. Zamkar went up to the floor, near the top of the house, and entered a large room, which was empty, but the walls were hung with curtains made of snake's skins, beautifully woven together. Ting a Ling slipped down to the floor, and, peeping behind these curtains, saw the hinge of a door, and without saying a word, he got behind the curtain, and, sure enough, there was a door. And there was a keyhole. And in a minute, there was Ting a Ling right through it. And there was the princess in a chair in the middle of a great room, crying as if her heart would break. By the light of the moon, which had now broken through the clouds, Ting a Ling saw that she was tied fast to the chair. 
So he climbed up on her shoulder, and called her by name, and when the princess heard him and knew him, she took him into her lovely hands, and kissed him, and cried over him, and laughed over him so much, that her joy had like to have been the death of him. When she got over her excitement, she told him how she had been stolen away, how she had heard her favorite cat squeak in the middle of the night, and how she had got up quickly to go to it, supposing it had been squeezed in some door, and how the wicked dwarf, who had been imitating the cat, was just outside the door with his slaves, and how they had seized her, and bound her, and carried her off to this castle, without waking up any of the king's household. Then Ting Ling told her that his five friends were there, and that they were going to see what they could do, and the princess was very glad to hear that, you may be sure. Then Ting Ling slipped down to the floor, and through the keyhole, and as he entered the room where he had left Zamkar, in came Alkahaza with the key and the other magicians with news that everybody was asleep. When Ting Ling had told about the princess, Alkahaza pushed aside the curtains, unlocked the door with the key, and they all entered the next room. There, sure enough, was the princess Alphalia, but, right in front of her, on the floor, squatted the dwarf, who had missed his key, and had slipped up by a back way. The magicians started back on seeing him, the princess was crying bitterly, and Ting Ling ran past the dwarf, who was laughing too horribly to notice him, and climbing upon the princess's shoulder, sat there among her curls, and did his best to comfort her. Anyway, said he, I shall not leave you again, and he drew his little sword, and felt as big as a house. The magicians now advanced towards the dwarf, but he, it seems, was a bit of a magician himself, for he waved a little wand, and instantly a strong partition of iron wire rose up out of the floor, and, reaching from one wall to the other, separated him completely from the five men. The magicians no sooner saw this than they cried out, Oh ho! Mr. Dwarf, is that your game? Yes, said the little wretch, chuckling, can you play at it? A little, said they, and each one pulled from under his cloak a long file, and filing the partition from the wall on each side, which only needed a few strokes from the sharp files, they pulled it entirely down. But before the magicians could reach him, the dwarf again waved his wand, and a great chasm opened in the floor before them, which was too wide to jump over, and so deep that the bottom could not be seen. Oh ho, cried the magicians, another game, eh? Yes indeed, cried the dwarf. Just let me see you play at that. Each of the magicians then took from under his magic cloak a long board, and, putting him over the chasm, they began to walk across them. But the dwarf jumped up and waved his wand, and water commenced to fall on the boards, where it immediately froze, and they were so slippery, that the magicians could hardly keep their feet, and could not make one step forward. Even standing still, they came very near falling off into the chasm below. I suppose you can play at that, said the dwarf, and the magicians replied. Oh yes, and each one took from under his cloak a pan of ashes, and sprinkled the boards, and walked right over. But before they reached the other edge, the dwarf pushed the chair, which was on rollers, up against the wall behind him, which opened, and instantly the princess, Ting a Ling, and the dwarf disappeared, and the wall closed up. Without saying a word, the magicians each drew from beneath his cloak a pickaxe, and they cut a hole in the wall in a few minutes. There was a large room on the other side, but it was entirely empty. So they sat down, and got out their magical calculators, and soon discovered that the princess was in the lowest part of the castle, but the magical calculators being a little out of order, they could not show exactly her place of confinement. Then the five hurried downstairs, where they found the slaves still asleep, but one poor little boy, whose business it was to get up early every morning and split kindling wood, having had none of the feast, was not very sleepy, and woke up when he heard footsteps near him. The magicians asked him if he could show them to the lowest part of the castle. All right, said he, this way, and he led him to where there was a great black hole, with a windlass over it. Get in the bucket, said he, and I will lower you down. Bucket, cried Alcahaza, is that a well? To be sure it is, said the boy, who had nothing on but the baby clothes he had worn ever since he was born, and which, as he was now about ten years old, had split a good deal in the back and arms, but in length they were very suitable. But there can be no one down there, said the magician. I see deep water, of course there is nobody there, replied the boy. Were you told to go down there to meet anybody? 
Because, if you were, you had better take some tubs down with you, to sit in. But all I know about it is, that it's the lowest part of this old hole of a castle. Boy, said Alcahazer, there is a young lady shut up down here somewhere. Do you know where she is? How old is she? asked the boy. About seventeen, said the magician. Oh then, if she is no older than that, I should think she'd be in the preserve closet, if she knew where it was, and the boy pointed to a great door, barred and locked, where the dwarf, who had a very sweet tooth, kept all his preserves locked up tight and fast. Zamkar stooped and looked through the keyhole of this door, and there, sure enough, was the princess. So the boy proved to be smarter than all the magicians. Each of our five friends now took from under his cloak a crowbar, and in a minute they had forced open the great door. But they had scarcely entered, when the dwarf, springing on the arm of the chair to which the princess was still tied, drew his sword, and clapped it to her throat, crying out, that if the magicians came one step nearer, he would slice her head off. Oh ho, cried they, is that your game? Yes indeed, said the chuckling dwarf, can you play at it? The magicians did not appear to think that they could, but Ting -a Ling, who was still on the princess's shoulder, though unseen by the dwarf, suddenly shouted, I can play, and in an instant he had driven his little sword into the dwarf's eye, who immediately sprang from the chair with a howl of anguish. While he was yelling and skipping about with his hands to his eyes, the poor boy, who hated him worse than pills, clapped a great jar of preserves over him, and sat down on the bottom of the jar. The magicians then untied the princess, and as she looked weak and faint, Zamkar, the youngest, took from under his cloak a little table, set with everything hot and nice for supper, and when the princess had eaten something and taken a cup of tea, she felt a great deal better. Alcahazer lifted up the jar from the dwarf, and there was the little rascal, so covered up with sticky jam, that he could not speak and could hardly move. So, taking an oilcloth bag from under his cloak, Alcahazer dropped the dwarf into it, and tied it up, and hung it to his girdle. The two youngest magicians made a sort of chair out of a shawl, and they carried the princess on it between them, very comfortably, and as Ting -a Ling still remained on her shoulder, she began to feel that things were beginning to look brighter. They then asked the poor boy what he would like best as a reward for what he had done, and he said that if they would shut him up in that room, and lock the door tight, and lose the key, he would be happy all the days of his life. So they left the boy, who knew what was good, and was already sucking away at a jar of preserved green gauges, in the room, and they shut the door and locked it tight, and lost the key, and he lived there for 91 years, eating preserves, and when they were all gone, he died. All that time he never had any clothes but his baby clothes, and they got pretty sticky before his death. Then our party left the castle, and as they passed the slaves still fast asleep, the three oldest magicians took from under their cloaks watering pots, filled with water that makes men sleep, and they watered the slaves with it, until they were wet enough to sleep a week. When they went through the gates of copper, brass, iron, and wood, they left them all open behind them. They had not gone far before they saw seventy-five men, all sitting in a row at the side of the road, and looking woefully indeed. They had been wet to the skin, and were now frozen stiff, not one of them being able to move anything but his eyelids, and they were all crying as if their hearts would break. So the magicians stopped, and the three oldest each took from under his cloak a pair of bellows, and they blew hot air on the poor creatures until they were all thawed. Then Alcahazer told them to go up to the castle, and take it for their own, and live there all the rest of their lives. He informed them that the dwarf was his prisoner, and that the slaves would sleep for a week. When the seventy-five guests, for those who had been taken from the feast, had joined their comrades, heard this, they all started up, and ran like deer for the castle, and when they reached it, they woke up their comrades, and took possession, and lived there all their lives. The man who had been first thrown through the window, and who had broken the way through the glass for the others, was elected their chief, because he had suffered the most, and accepting the trouble of doing their own work for a week, until the slaves awoke, these people were very happy ever afterwards. It was just daylight when our party left the dwarf's castle, and by the next evening they had reached the palace. The army had not got back, and there was no one there but the ladies of the princess. When these saw their dear mistress, there was never before such a kissing, and hugging, and crying, and laughing. 
Ting Ling came in for a good share of praise and caressing, and if he had not slipped away to tell his tale to the Fairy Queen, there is no knowing what would have become of him. The magicians sat down outside of the princess's apartments, to guard her until the army should return, and the ladies would have kissed and hugged them, in their gratitude and joy, if they had not been such dignified and grave personages. Now, the king, the prince, and the great army, had gone miles and miles away in the opposite direction to the dwarf's castle, and the princess and her ladies could not think how to let them know what had happened. As for ringing the great bell, they knew that that would be useless, for they would never hear it at the distance they were, and so they wished that they had some fireworks to set off. Therefore Zamkar, the youngest magician, offered to go up to the top of the palace and set off some. So, when he got up to the roof, he lifted up his cloak, and took out some fireworks, and set him off, and the light shone for miles and miles, and the king and all his army saw it. The king had just begun to feel tired, and to think that he would pitch his tent, and rest for the night by the side of a pleasant stream they had reached, when he saw the light from the palace, and instantly knew that there had been tidings of the princess, kings are so smart, you know. So, when his slaves came to ask him where they should pitch his tent, he shouted, pitch it in the river. Tension, army, right about face, for home, march, and away the whole army marched for home, the band playing the lively air of cream cakes for supper, hey oh, hey oh, oh, cream cakes for supper, hey oh, hey oh, so as to keep up the spirits of the tired men. When they approached the palace, which was all lighted up, there was the princess standing at the great door, in her Sunday clothes, and looking as lovely as a full-blown rose. The king jumped from his high-metalled racer, and went up the steps, two at a time, but the prince, springing from his fiery steed, bounded up three steps at once, and got there first. When he and the king had got through hugging and kissing the princess, her Sunday clothes looked as if they had been worn a week. Now then for supper, said the king, and I hope it's ready. But the princess said never a word, for she had forgotten all about supper, and all the ladies hung their heads, and were afraid to speak. But when they reached the great hall, they found that the magicians had been at work, and had cooked a grand supper. There it was, on ever so many long tables, all smoking hot, and smelling delightfully. So they all sat down, for there was room enough for every man, and nobody said a word until he was as tight as a drum. When they had all had enough, and were just about to begin to talk, there were heard strains of the most delightful soft music, and directly, in at a window came the queen of the fairies, attended by her court, all mounted on beautiful golden moths and dragonflies. When they reached the velvet table in front of the throne, where the king had been eating, with his plate on his lap, they arranged themselves in a circle on the table, and the queen spoke out in a clear little voice, that could have been heard almost anywhere, and announced to the king that the little Ting A Ling, who now wore her royal scarf, was the preserver of his daughter. Oh ho, said the king, and what can I do for such a mite as you, my fine little fellow? Then Ting A Ling, who wanted nothing for himself, and only thought of the good of his people, made a low bow to the king, and shouted at the top of his voice, Your royal gardeners are going to make asparagus beds all over our fairy pleasure grounds. If you can prevent that, I have nothing more to ask. Blow, Horner, blow, cried the king, and hear all men. If any man, woman, or child, from this time henceforward forever, shall dare to set foot in the garden now occupied by the fairies, he shall be put to death, he and all his family, and his relations, as far as they can be traced. Take notice of that, every one of you. Ting A Ling then bowed his thanks, and all the people made up their minds to take very particular notice of what the king had said. Then the magicians were ordered to come forward and name their reward, but they bowed their heads, and simply besought the king that he would grant them seven rice straws, the peeling from a red apple, and the heel from one of his old slippers. What in the name of common sense they wanted with these, no one but themselves knew, but magicians are such strange creatures. When these valuable gifts had been bestowed upon them, the five good magicians departed, leaving the dwarf for the king to do what he pleased with. This little wretch was shut up in an iron cage, and every day was obliged to eat three codfish, a bushel of Irish potatoes, and eleven pounds of bran crackers, and to drink a gallon of cambric tea, all of which things he despised from the bottom of his miserable little heart. 
Now, cried the king, all is settled, and let everybody go to bed. There is room enough in the palace for all to sleep tonight. Form in line, and to bed, march. So they all formed in line, and began to march to bed, to the music of the band, and the fairies, their little horns blowing, and with Ting and Ling at the post of honor by the queen, took up their line of march, out of the window to the garden, which was to be, henceforward forever, their own. Just as they were all filing out, in flew little Parsley on the back of his butterfly, which had been hatched out at last. Hello, cried he, is it all over, pretty nearly, said Ting a Ling. It's just letting out. How came you to be so late? Easy enough, said poor little Parsley. Of all the mean things that ever was the pokiest long time in unwrapping its wings, this butterfly's the meanest.